It is now my pleasure and my honor to introduce our opening keynote speaker for the Spark More meeting. As I mentioned, we've seen many more private funding agencies establish and create open access policies, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I believe, is a game changer in this area. So we are very honored today to have Richard, better known as Dick Wilder, here as our keynote speaker. Dick is the Associate General Counsel in the Global Health Program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. His portfolio includes providing legal support for a wide range of foundation projects, including the development and delivery of drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics for the developing world. He has an extensive background in both intellectual property law and public health, having previously served as the Associate General for Intellectual Property Policy at Microsoft Corporation, as well as serving as a partner in a global firm where he specialized in international law. Dick has advised the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, the World Health Organization, the Medicines for Malaria Venture, the Global Alliance for TB Drug Development, and the US Agency for International Development on matters at the intersection of public health and IP law. He's also the former director of the Global Intellectual Property Issues Division of the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, where he worked on IP issues relating to public health, genetic resources, traditional knowledge, and human rights. All of this experience uniquely qualified him to help lead the efforts at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as they created their landmark open access policy. His talk today will offer key insights into the process of developing and implementing this policy, as well as explore the foundation's work in fostering a culture of openness among a larger community of research funders. Dick, we are so pleased and honored to have you here as our speaker today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dick Wilder. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorraine, for those very uh, kind words. And uh, I hope that I can be as, as uh, elegant and as on point as Lorraine was in, in her introductory remarks. Um, I'm, I'm truly honored to be here today uh, to speak on behalf of the Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, on this topic and uh, to be keynoting this address at the Spark meeting. Um, I feel that um, I have a, a certain kinship uh, with you here. Even though this is the first time I've spoken to a Spark meeting, my mother actually was a librarian. Um, and uh, she was a librarian at a high school just uh, north of Seattle, Washington. And uh, as I was growing up, um, uh, she, I think, in, in a way, kind of um, planted the seed for, for what I've been doing over the last few years at the Gates Foundation around open access because she really emphasized the importance of knowledge and information and did everything that she possibly could to help you know, the students at the school and myself and my brother and my sister uh, get what we needed in terms of information resources in order to, to be successful in the work that we were doing. I wanted to uh, thank Spark because as Lorraine indicated, they really are uh, a leader uh, in this field and they've done uh, a lot, both professionally and even personally, in terms of helping us at the foundation that are working, on, uh, working in this space and working on our policy to be successful. Um, I wanted to cover three broad topics here today. Um, first, you know, certainly I'm going to speak to the importance of open access uh, and open data. Uh, and I also want to speak to the importance of, of leadership. Again, this is something that uh, Lorraine uh, emphasized, and it's something that I think all of us here in the room agree uh, that we can play a leadership role uh, both within our own institutions as well as within organizations like Spark and then with uh, the larger world uh, when we're trying to move forward on, on openness with respect to materials and data. Um, second, I did want to provide an update on our initiative at the, at the Gates Foundation on open access. Uh, talk about that specifically in terms of where it came from, where we currently are, and where we're looking to go in the near future with respect to the implementation of the policy. And finally, if you'll indulge me a bit, what I'd like to do is to take uh, uh, a bit of a view over the horizon, if you will, in terms of 
what we're going to be doing in the near future and medium term around access to data more broadly. Um, you know, but first of all, maybe just expand a little bit more on, on my background and involvement uh, in the policy. Lorraine, you know, quite well summarized uh, my career and how it uh, led me to, uh, to uh, where I am now here at the foundation. Um, but uh, the policy itself that I'll be describing here was something that was uh, developed cooperatively within the foundation. I was the lead in developing the policy and now Jennifer Hansen, who many of you know, is leading on its implementation. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about the relationship between what we call our global access policy and our open access policy, which is really the focus of the discussion here today. Uh, but it's important to understand the evolution within the foundation of not just the terms, but the concepts behind them. Um, we have, and I've been involved, uh, as Lorraine indicated, I was, I'm in the, the global health program at the foundation and consequently have been involved uh, very intensely in programs in that space over the years, including just a decade ago now, we built something called the Collaboration for AIDS Vaccine Discovery. And that has as a core component of it, a data and material sharing agreement that includes within it certain obligations on publication, certain obligations on sharing data within the collaboration, then ultimately to the larger scientific community. And we've built on that in other areas as well. We have a TB drug accelerator project and other similar kinds of initiatives within the global health program that have as the core uh, principles around access to information and access to data. And really the passion that I feel for the work that I'm going to describe here today comes from that experience where I have an opportunity to work very closely with uh, researchers, researchers in academic institutions, researchers in the for-profit sector and government labs and so forth, and understand what it is that they need in order to be successful in developing a new AIDS vaccine or developing new drugs for the treatment of tuberculosis. And following through that path of the work from a scientific perspective, what then that means in terms of transferring materials, what that means in terms of transferring data and making that data accessible internal to the project and then external to the broader scientific community. And so it's not just a theoretical um, uh, exercise, you know, for me or those of us at the foundation, but rather it's embedded in the work that we do. So before I talk about um, the Gates Foundation open access policy, I want to give you a brief overview of the foundation itself. Um, we're about 15 years old. Uh, we have uh, three co-chairs, Bill and Melinda Gates and Bill Gates Sr., and three trustees, Bill Gates, Melinda Gates, and uh, Warren Buffett. So uh, our focus is on those areas across uh, the different fields in which we work that we think uh, require the greatest amount of attention. Um, and you know, we, we make that determination internally and then we build programs out on top of those determinations in order to move forward in developing new products and services and so forth that can address those needs that we've uh, represented. And we work in a broad range of activities. Uh, we have um, the, the largest funded uh, areas of our activity are in global health, which is where I'm embedded, global development, and the US program. Um, we also have programs in global policy and advocacy and communications, but I'm gonna be focusing really more on the programmatic um, part of the work of the foundation. Now, in, in global development, as was explained, or global health, rather, as was explained, uh, we're focusing really on developing new tools, new drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics to um, attack and hopefully eliminate, um, if not reduce, the burden of disease uh, that we see around the world. In our global development program, it has a lot to do with um, building uh, out uh, resources around uh, agriculture, around financial services for the poor, and there's also a significant part of it that has to do with the delivery of, of uh, healthcare products. So new vaccines, once developed, then have to be rolled out uh, into the world and made accessible and used uh, by people that are suffering from the diseases that we deal with. Um, and in connection uh, with uh, the work across all of those programmatic areas, also I should, I should actually emphasize as well, uh, the U.S. program, um, which has to do with improving education in the United States. Um, and in that context, uh, we obviously engage a lot with the Department of, of Education uh, here in this country and then, you know, with um, educational resources across the United States. 
So that one, as distinct from global health and global development, is focused on uh, US and in particular on improving uh, education in this country. Now, as we undertake to do our work and we fund um, our work through grants, through contracts, and through uh, PRIs or program-related investments, we have as a core, um, I would say, both philosophy and management directive for our projects, uh, something that we call global access. And global access, as a principle, has been followed at the foundation since around 2003, 2004, uh, when it came into existence. And it has uh, two components to it, one of which I'll be emphasizing during my talk here today, uh, and another one which is really important to the delivery, the sharp end of the spear, if you will, in terms of getting uh, the products out uh, into the markets that we want to affect. So the first one has to do with uh, ensuring that the knowledge and information that arises from our funding is uh, uh, broadly and rapidly accessible. And there we talk about information, data, written materials, and so forth. And so it, you know, this has been part of the DNA, if you will, of the foundation for well over a decade to ensure that uh, that's achieved. The second part, and it has to do with ensuring that once we invest in a new uh, product or new technology, that it actually gets out and has an effect in the real world. Uh, and I think it's easier to see, at least it's easiest for me since I'm in the Global Health Program, to see it from that perspective, where if we develop a new, um, or we, we fund the development of a new drug to treat malaria, we want to see that drug get out uh, into those countries where malaria is endemic and actually reduce the burden of that disease, reduce mortality and reduce morbidity. And so in that context, you know, we're, we work very closely with with uh, the universities that we're involved with, with industry, with government labs, to say the deal is, is that we're funding this research and at the end of the day, those products that arise from our funding will be available, um, including on price terms that are accessible uh, to the markets that we serve. So given, given the following, uh, the following three components, if you will, uh, the global access concept that runs through our work that I've just described, um, the strong belief of our founders, as you would expect you know, from uh, people like Bill and Melinda Gates that are really very science-driven, very data-driven, the strong belief of our founders that science can help us find solutions to some of the world's hardest problems. And three, um, there's no way that we can possibly solve these problems on our own. And this applies you know, whether it's developing new products, bringing them to market, uh, broadening research opportunities. We can't do it on our own. And so it's no surprise, it should be no surprise, that we look increasingly to uh, open sharing, open access uh, to uh, that that arises from our funding in order to ensure that our grantees and those others that are working in the fields that we're interested in have access to um, the tools that we develop, the information that we develop, and the data that we develop. Um, so. Let's uh, talk about the, the pipeline, or the timeline, rather, for the development of our policy, our open access policy. And I'll get to the policy itself uh, in just a moment. Um, so over the last five years, we focused more on how we can make real world progress on that aspiration of openness and access to information and to data. Um, now, I started the timeline here at 2010, uh, and I'll explain a little bit about what that particular element is. But it really does go back to what I described earlier, 2003, 2004, with our global access policy. So in 2010, uh, there was an article that was written in, uh, uh, in uh, PLOS, I think, uh, Medicine. Um, but it was, uh, it was an article that was jointly authored by um, the, head of the, the then head of our uh, global health program at the foundation, as well as the heads of the World Health Organization, the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, malaria, Gavi, the UN Population Fund, the World Bank, UNAIDS, UNICEF, and it was a call for better access to data. And you know, I think it's important that I just read out basically what you know they said in that article. Uh, better access to data and statistics in the public domain could generate important de benefits at country and global levels by fostering collaboration and innovation in statistical and analytical methods, both for new data collection and for better use of existing data. Now, since that time, uh, the foundation and those institutions that I mentioned have been moving forward in terms of providing 
better and more open access to data that arises from their activities, and in our case, from our funding in particular. Um, so as we <clears throat> were looking at that kind of a, a worldview, and that worldview in connection with our global access policy, there then came a point where um, we said, you know, basically to distill it down, is that we don't currently have a publication policy. Uh, we should have a publication policy. And so that began the process of developing what became our open access policy, where we knew that we needed to be more purposive in terms of what we asked of our grantees to do around ensuring that uh, publications that arise from our funding and that are ultimately published in peer-reviewed peer journals are made available as well as the underlying data. Um, and we, in, in this process, uh, we had a process that was both, I say, in the, in the initial phase was internally focused and then ultimately became much more broadly uh, externally focused. But internally we had um, a, an 11 person working group that I led and we purposefully and necessarily actually formed that working group so that we had people from global health, global development, and US programs. So we had the broad range of activities of the foundation um, represented. Um, we, we then um, you know, uh, uh, continued that discussion internally as to what would be both desirable and possible. We had discussions externally as to what would be desirable and, and possible. And there, of course, um, you know, like all of you in the room, uh, we recognized uh, that there were uh, other actors that were ahead of us, if you will, in terms of developing those policies. So we worked very closely, you know, certainly with Spark, but also with, um, with the, the Wellcome Trust, with um, the NIH, and a host of other external parties that had actually gone before in, in terms of developing policies. We then um, presented to our executive leadership in May of 2014 and announced the policy in November of 2014. So what did we come up with? <clears throat> um, we came up with um, a policy that had a number of elements. As a matter of fact, I would say all of the elements that are, were then and, and certainly are now familiar to those that work in open access, especially with respect to peer-reviewed journal articles. They had to be findable and discoverable online. They had to be licensed under open access terms, immediately available. And uh, we also um, agreed that we would pay reasonable APC charges. Um, now, you know, at the time that we put our policy in place, we recognized that there were um, a number of, of institutions, and by that I would mean both publishers as well as our grantees, that weren't yet ready uh, to take uh, the steps that we were, uh, we were going to require. And so we put in place um, a two-year time period during which we would uh, you know, gradually um, uh, uh, implement this uh, policy. Um, I wanted to emphasize, or I wanted to focus on a couple elements actually in this policy. One has to do with uh, the license that we require, and you know, certainly during the course of the event here over the next couple of days, I'd be happy to talk in more detail about this, but we specifically required a CC BY license or an equivalent thereof. Uh, so Creative Commons uh, attribution only license. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in terms of the significance of that as we get into the data access piece of my presentation. But we recognize at the time the policy was put in place and I think uh, it, it has only been reinforced as we've gone through the implementation of that policy that <clears throat> that license actually was going to enable us to get to the place that we wanted as a foundation uh, more directly and more, more quickly uh, than other types of, of licenses, especially we had a lot of discussion about um, including uh, non-commercial as one potential element in the license, and decided what we wanted to do was to, in essence, um, uh, create a, a policy that would have uh, a driving force to build a corpus of material that's both, uh, that's in a digital form of text and data that would be broadly searchable and broadly usable and not just broadly within you know, the, the channel of one particular publisher, but across publishers. And that we saw the only way to be able to do that was through the CC BY license. Um, so uh, we have a policy, now what? How do we implement the policy without um, you know, creating disruptions or chaos? 
um, how, how can we remove barriers to our researchers in regards to publishing on open access terms. Again, you know, for, for starters, we have the two-year transition period I mentioned, um, and our grantees publish with a wide range of publishers, uh, a small subsection of which are represented here on this slide. Um, and we have worked um, very closely with not only our grantees and had a lot of engagement with grantees, but also with the publishers themselves in order to um, um, determine um, how we would be able to best uh, implement this policy that would place uh, the least amount of burden on both our grantees and uh, publishers. So we implemented um, two immediate changes, uh, well, actually a number of immediate changes, um, most of which are kind of behind the curtain, if you will, but it involved uh, including in our grant agreement language, our contract language, and so on, um, specific clauses that implemented this policy to make it, make it a requirement for receiving funding from the Gates Foundation that um, the requirements of this policy would be um, uh, fully implemented. Um, and the other aspect of it had to do with uh, how we manage our, um, our, financial, uh, our financial management behind the grants, and that is uh, to make it so that our grantees would not have to pay for uh, APC charges, um, uh, article publishing charges outside of their grant fees, but rather it will be paid directly by us uh, to the publisher. So basically an additional uh, amount, if you will, to, to grants. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the top line, you know, figures, and we can get into more of the details during the discussion, but one of the top line figures is kind of going into this process, that is after the policy was announced, or I would say within the first year, um, it became apparent that about 90% of, of articles that are published that arise from our funding are published in journals that are already fully in compliance with the policy uh, that I put up. And so, um, as, as you would expect, given that fact, is that we've been focusing our attention uh, on those publishers that are not in compliance. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's important, you know, for me to state quite clearly that um, come the end of uh, this year, 2016, when our policy comes fully into force, then our grantees will be obliged to publish um, articles in peer-reviewed journals in accordance with our policy, which will mean that if there are still remaining uh, some journals that are not in compliance with the policy, they will not then be able to publish in those journals. Um, we've been making progress um, and continue to make progress in discussions with uh, journals that are not in fully in compliance or have indicated that they won't be by the end of this year. Um, so that's um, a work in progress. Let me um, quickly now talk a bit about the mechanics or at least one layer of the mechanics that we're putting in place. And that is a system <coughs> uh, called Kronos. It's a web-based platform that enables us to track our peer-reviewed published research. And this is a, a, this is a facility that is uh, available to our grantees to have access to that they can then readily determine uh, what journals are in compliance with our, our policy. Um, it's also a mechanism uh, through which then once a decision has been made to publish in a given journal uh, that it will basically authorize, if you will, a payment to be made by the foundation to, to, that, uh, uh, to that journal for the article to be, I'm sorry, for the APC charges uh, to be paid. Um, so I'm, I'm putting up a couple slides as we go along, and I'm going over you know, this, back, this aspect of things uh, rather quickly because I wanted to get to um, the, uh, the broader data access uh, piece of my talk. Um, I'm going over it quickly, uh, not to de-emphasize it. It really is a critical part of the infrastructure that we're putting in place. Uh, but it also is something that requires, I think, um, a bit more time you know, for uh, you to have access you know, if you are going to be working um, with uh, Kronos because you are a grantee of the foundation, then uh, get access to the tool and, and walk through it. But the intent is that it's offering a seamless experience to users, uh, to grantees, that includes manuscript submission, payment management, and reporting functions. Um, and it supports our, our grantees, participants, in complying with our open access policy. Um, one, one aspect of this is um, that we uh, will have, as a consequence of this system, uh, more and better information 
um, about uh, where articles that arise from our funding are published. It will also provide us with information that we don't currently have, which is uh, the cost of publishing in an open access format because, again, the APC charges will be paid directly by us to the publishers, and so we'll be able to collect that information. And as I mentioned in our policy, our policy does enable us to pay reasonable um, APC charges. Um, we haven't yet come up with a, um, a fixed definition of what reasonable means in terms of the dollar amount, um, but you know this information will enable us uh, to do that, and it is definitely something that we're mindful of that we need to uh, look at um, more, more uh, I would say, more carefully and more consistently and more coherently. Um, so that's uh, one of the next things that we, we need to do. Um, so uh, once, uh, a, um, once uh, a grantee then has put in information about what and where they want to publish, there will be a results screen that will identify um, the different publications that are available because they fully comply with the policy. Um, and it will also uh, provide information about um, the costs. You can see that down in the bottom of the screen. Uh, the cost for the a APC charges. Again, not that that comes out of the grantees funds, but for information for them, information for us as to what the costs are. And then once the manuscript is accepted, um, the author will get a um, notification from uh, the uh, chrono system as well as from the publisher that it has been um, accepted. And then um, we are, through the system, working behind the scenes to, uh, again, make the payments and and uh, there's no further steps that need to be taken to ensure that the paper is properly deposited in, in PubMed Central. Um, so what's next? Um, we have an anticipated launch date of July 1, 2016 for the Chrono system. And again, the policy becoming fully in force as of uh, the end of this year, or put another way, January 1, 2017. And let me just say it a second time, just for emphasis, is that Come that uh, date, and for um, uh, for articles that arise out of uh, out of grants that were made uh, after January one of last year, then all of our grantees will have to comply uh, with the policy, which will mean they'll have to publish in uh, compliant journals. And again, ninety and an increasing percentage of journals uh, that our grantees publish in are compliant. Uh, we're working on those that aren't, um, but you know, as of that date, um, they will have to be published in compliant journals. So, what's next for the foundation? Um, and here, I'm going to step away from our open access policy as it relates to publications in peer-reviewed journals, and uh, to something that um, is is quite a bit broader, uh, and that is access to data. Now, one thing I, I gloss glossed over a little bit was that one of the components of our open access policy is that the data that underlies the publication also has to be available on open access terms as of the date of publication. Uh, but here I'm stepping a bit beyond that and talking about data access writ large, if you will, uh, and what uh, we want as a foundation, what we're looking uh, to achieve as a foundation around data access. And you know, again, I, I put up on the screen our global access policy that we've been working with for well over 10 years that does have um, uh, a, a data access component to it. Um, there's the H8 paper in PLOS Medicine that I mentioned. Um, and since the publication of that paper within the foundation, first in global health and then more broadly, we've put in place um, uh, uh, projects and requirements around data access some of which are in relation to larger initiatives like the Collaboration for AIDS Vaccine Discovery that I mentioned, which now has about 120 institutions around the world. I think there's 20 countries that are represented that have as a core component data and material sharing uh, agreements. Um, and then we also, on a case-by-case -case basis in given areas, we have specific requirements around data access, certainly access to data by foundation staff to better run the projects, but then also looking to uh, accelerate uh, the access to data of material that arises from our funding to the broader scientific community. Um, and uh, the question uh, uh, could be, although I think you know, for you here in the room, um, you, you already know and, and have your own you know, 
uh, views as to why access to data is important. But what I wanted to do is to show a short film. Um, it's movie time. <laughs> um, I wanted to show a short film uh, that I think describes you know, very well and actually to the current moment as to what the foundation is thinking about in terms of access to data. 15 years ago, this woman gave birth in an unseen and forgotten corner of the world. The chance that her daughter would survive to the age of five was tragically low. And over the years, both mother and child would continue to face serious threats to their health. Today, many of these risks have been cut in half. But the overall picture is far from perfect. Most births here still occur at home and are never registered. Less than a third of the people in the village are vaccinated. Medical histories are sparse and surveillance data is infrequently collected. Along with billions of others, she's invisible to the health system meant to support her. Health workers, who depend on reliable information to make critical decisions, are themselves left in the dark. This isn't just about health systems in the most isolated parts of the world. These problems are everywhere. We waste resources collecting the same data multiple times and in multiple formats while ignoring entire populations and demographics. We trap valuable data between borders or in isolated, incompatible systems and then rely on extrapolated data to drive critical decisions. Let's reimagine how data can transform global health. Fifteen years from now, the situation for this young woman, now a mother herself, is very different. The infrastructure in her village has of course improved, but the biggest change is the impact that data now has on her life and the lives of those around her. Imagine that every individual now has a digital health identity that can be shared securely to improve not just their own health, but everyone's. When this data is integrated with a range of other vital information, we can create models that reveal the most important risk factors and health issues from the global level down to the smallest communities. We'd then be able to prioritize our efforts and direct our resources based on actual needs and greatest potential. We could anticipate threats and respond to them quickly. Data would cross borders faster than diseases. Nobody would be invisible. This may sound too good to be true, but together we're already making progress. New data collection techniques like dried blood spot testing promise to produce comprehensive health profiles efficiently and affordably, even in the most difficult geographies. We're battling malaria more effectively thanks to the use of geospatial mapping and new analytic tools that can crosswalk datasets. Global health organizations, academic institutions and product developers are leading an open data revolution. And when this data flows freely in all directions, so will innovation. Product development cycles will accelerate. Proven interventions will reach scale faster. Fifteen years from now, essential drugs, vaccines and diagnostics will be available wherever they are needed. And every health system will be able to deliver services tailored to the context of their communities. And this new mother will know with confidence that she has the information and support she needs to take care of herself and her family. We all would. And if we can imagine it, we can make it happen. Imagine it, make it happen. So this, this uh, obviously was focused on our global health program, but we have um, a very similar attitude expressed across the foundation in global health, global development, and the US program having to do with education in this country. Um, so how do we make this real? I mean, this is it's a, you know interesting and inspiring uh, piece. I mean, one of the things that I wanted to, to note was that you know, sometimes I think that this, these discussions, especially about um, you know, global data and global access and being able to have access and to manipulate, make use of data, tends to uh, forget about and leave out the individual. And you know, in the video there was discussion about the, uh, the woman and her child, and I think that one thing that um, we, we emphasize in the work that we do is our, our issues of both the legal constraints uh, having to do with privacy as well as ethical 
issues around privacy and informed consent in terms of participation in trials and providing data about themselves and making sure that the data sets that are, are generated and shared and make use of don't um, disclose personally identifiable uh, information. So it's, it's important, you know, I think for all of us that work in this, this area to keep that in mind that we do need to not just be mindful of those requirements, but look at them as not just legal requirements, but ethical requirements and build it into the work that we do. Now going forward, um, uh, I, one of the things that I wanted to, uh, to, to talk about is how, this, uh, how these issues around access to information and access to data play out on the global scale. And many of you are familiar with the, um, the Millennium Development Goals that have now become the Sustainable Development Goals as of September 25th of 2015. And these are a set of goals that were promulgated uh, by the UN to end poverty, protect the planet, ensure prosperity for all, and undertake to do a number of other things in 17 different targets that were identified. And each goal has specific targets that are to be achieved over the next 15 years. Now the goal of greatest interest to the Global Health Program, the one that I'm emphasizing here is number three, on good health and well-being. Um, and the beauty of this goal, like the, um, like the, um, uh, the goals that came before, um, the Millennium Development Goals, is the fact that they include numeric goals, you know, specific targets that we're uh, aiming uh, to meet. Uh, which means that you have something that is measurable, which means then that you want to have access to data to determine you know, what is the nature of the problem that you're trying to solve that's represented by that goal, and secondly, are you making progress towards achieving that goal? So there's a couple that I wanted to emphasize and then to go into a bit more detail here as to the work that we're doing. So uh, first, and I'll just read these out, uh, by 2030, end preventable deaths of newborns and children under five years of age, with all countries aiming to reduce neonatal mortality to at least as low as 12 per 1,000 live births, and under five mortality to at least as low as 25 per 1,000 live births. And by 2030, end the epidemics of AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, and neglected tropical diseases and combat hepatitis, waterborne diseases, and other communicable diseases. So in undertaking to do this, how then do we uh, focus our needs? Well, we need to um, you know, certainly focus and prioritize. We need to know uh, what the burden of these individual diseases are. And this, and I'll go into uh, a little bit more detail in a moment as to where this information comes from, but, you know, these bubble charts show uh, in relative size uh, the burden of disease that's reflected by uh, the diseases in the bubbles from pneumonia, malaria, diarrheal disease, HIV, uh, encephalitis, and so forth. And so what we need to know is, uh, in the first instance, like I said, what is the, the burden of, of that disease? And then once we've you know, determined the overall burden, we need to drill down and we need to understand better what is it that gave rise to the disease itself. And so in the case of malaria, what are the, um, what are the vectors of the disease? What are ways to, uh, to intersect or interfere with that vector? What are ways that we can uh, cure or or um, uh, provide prophylaxis uh, for people that are living in malaria endemic areas. And so that leads to questions about um, all the different existing tools that are available from bed nets to existing drugs. What's the gap in terms of drugs? What new ones do we need because old ones are losing effectiveness? What do we need in terms of a vaccine? Uh, which would be you know, the ultimate way to solve this problem would be to vac you know, an effective vaccine um, against it. And so in, in doing that work, we work with a number of, of actors in this space, if you will, one of which is um, the International Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington that um, every year uh, publishes the global burden of disease, or I should say they do so on a rolling basis for different diseases and different geographies, uh, but they've provided a significant amount of information about <clears throat> the uh, diseases, those that we're interested in, and then a much broader range of uh, diseases uh, that go beyond you know, what the foundation funds in, especially uh, you know, we're interested more in communicable diseases, infectious diseases, and they focus a lot on, on non-communicable diseases as well. Um, let me just pause on this slide because one of the things I wanted to mention <clears throat> about IHME is that um, we do have, we do have an, uh, a data access agreement with IHME 
uh, to provide you know, access to us and to researchers of the data sets that they use in order to uh, do their estimates of the burden of disease and the burden not just at the national level in countries around the world, but subnational level. Um, you know, they are, excuse me, they are somewhat hobbled, if you will, by the data that they can provide more broadly because they themselves, with, with a couple of exceptions, don't, you know, generate the raw data that they use in order to do their analysis, but rather it comes from other sources, from governments, NGOs, and the like. And, you know, they take in that data through uh, data use agreements, and those data use agreements, some are very open, uh, some are more closed that allow them to use the data, but don't allow them to broadly share it. So one of the things that we're doing with IHME is to, uh, to uh, move that playing field from one where uh, those data use agreements uh, do include a large a number of which are more closed than open to the opposite end of the spectrum where they're more open than closed. And so that involves us in working with our grantee IHME and they you know, are taking active steps in order to move in that direction. And through our funding you know, with others that are generating data, we are you know, moving in that direction as well. So it's a multi-pronged process, if you will, in order to move from a more closed environment for data to a more open one. Um, so the Global Burden of Disease study by IHME, like I said, they, they you know, work on, on the left in the blue is, um, is uh, non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases, accidents, and so forth. Uh, to determine you know, what the, the overall uh, burden is. And then again, we need to drill down into that to get data about what's happening at uh, the local level, uh, what's happening as we roll out interventions, including vaccines uh, and so on. And all of that is, is highly data-driven. Um, the, the next thing I wanted to, to discuss, and as a matter of fact, it's the, uh, the last uh, specific topic for my speech here this morning is um, work that we're doing on healthy growth, birth, and, and development. Um, now, you remember a couple of things. You know, one is um, the the, uh, the movie presentation that showed the mother and her child and wanting to be able to follow um, the progression of uh, the child from from birth and even pre-birth um, through her her development, both physical as well as cognitive development. You also remember that uh, one of the objectives uh, in, the, um, um, in the, um, uh, the goals of the UN uh, under health is to um, reduce um, neonatal uh, problems or um, health and development issues with respect to uh, newborn children. So in <clears throat> the, one of the programs that we have at the foundation is to um, look into healthy birth growth and development. So it's a, something called the Knowledge Integration Initiative. And this is an initiative, again, you know, that relies to a certain extent on data that we ourselves, our own program officers have developed, data that has arisen directly from our funding, which you know, we can require then that that data would be open and accessible not only to us but to the larger scientific community. But we're also working a lot with data providers from around the world. As a matter of fact, I think the, the cohort, um, sort of the, the, the aggregate cohort that we're dealing with at the moment of children on a global basis is, is uh, about two million. And the, the goal is by the end of this year to have something on the order of, of five million. I may have those figures wrong because they are changing all the time as we are getting access to, to more data. But again, like I described with IHME, some of the data sets that we get in are subject to restrictions that make it more difficult to more broadly share. And part of what we need to do, and part of what you know, we're asking um, communities like this to do is to think about um, what you know, restraints or restrictions that you put on access to data and whether they can be made uh, more open, whether they can be you know, done so in a way, again, that doesn't offend uh, law and morality around uh, personal privacy uh, that addresses um, some of the other issues that arise with respect to access to data that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and as we, you know, go through this work, uh, we, you know, use this data set to determine what are the, the causes, environmental causes, causes uh, that arise because of the health condition uh, of the mother uh, causes that arise because of uh, 
specific genetic issues with respect to a given child that give rise to uh, a child being small for gestational age because being small for gestational age correlates um, quite closely with uh, cognitive issues. And so we, we want to be able to understand what is it that is causing that observed result that could potentially lead to things that are not observed and especially uh, cognitive issues. And then steps that we can take moving backwards in order to uh, eliminate those causes. Um, as we um, undertake to do this work, as I indicated, we, we have um, a number of different um, uh, data sets that we're using in order to do the kind of analysis that I've described in order to determine um, the causes for a child being small for gestational age. Um, those data sets come from a number of different sources and lead us uh, to draw some conclusions about what is it that's causing you know, that, that result that we've observed. Um, sorry. So this seems to be uh, um, hanging up. Oh. Well, th th this is a couple slides down the road, but um, <laughs> let, me, uh, let me just say that, uh, w w you know, w w just th th the point to be made here is, is actually distills down to something that is, is uh, quite simple, and that is that, um, you know, we, we, want to, um, we want to be able to, well, two things. We, we have, you know, specific, work that we're trying to accomplish at the foundation. And again, in the case of healthy birth growth and development, we want children to be born healthy and to grow healthy and to develop uh, appropriately. And in order for us to be able to do that, we need to understand what it is that's causing um, uh, problem births, that's causing um, children to be born a small for gestational age and what then can be done in order to correct that. Some things are, are quite simple in terms of improving the health of the mother, improving nutrition and so forth. Others of the causes are, are more, more complicated, but one needs to understand first um, what the problem is and what's, uh, what's causing it before you can begin to come up with uh, solutions. Um, so let me do this. So on this slide, um, my boss, Bill Gates, loves data. He loves graphs, and he once said that the graph on the left was his uh, favorite graph, um, because it really is something that he and Melinda, um, you know, in a, in a very broad sense, have been, uh, were first um, uh, motivated to do the work they do at the foundation because of the recognition of so many uh, under five deaths, um, you know, back in the early days of, of the foundation. And they, and not just alone, again, I mean, working with a number of partners uh, around the world have taken steps to make investments in new technologies, new ways of intervening in order to reduce uh, global under five deaths so that it has, you know, from 1990 to 2015, there's been a 53% drop. And um, <clears throat> as you've seen from the sustainable development goals, the objective is to bring that uh, even lower. Um, and then um, I have my own favorite graph Two on the right hand side, which uh, comes from Spark, about the uh, increase in the number of articles published by CC BY over the past uh, decade. Um, so I, you know, I think one can, uh, one can, and it might require a little bit of effort, but one can draw at least a correlation between the two, if not some degree of causation. That is, you know, as we have in our work, you know, tried to drive towards more openness with respect to sharing of published materials, sharing of data, you know, we have been able to draw in a wider range of actors uh, into our work and make available for them kind of the grist for the mill, if you will, in terms of doing the work. Um, and uh, you may very well think that I'm pandering to the crowd <laughs> by saying that, but I, I honestly think that that's true and we see that, we have seen that in uh, the work that we've done and, you know, I think in terms of of what we're trying to drive going forward around more open access to the data that we're going to see um, even more, more evidence of that. Um, so, you know, one way to think about it again is, is just the interrelationship amongst actors. I mean, we saw that in the, uh, in the publishing sector with the, the funders, the researchers, the publishers, the consumers of the published material, 
um, that there is this, uh, this ecosystem that interrelates. Um, it's the same when it comes to, to data access that you have you know, those uh, that are funding you know, scientific research that leads to data, the academics that are generating it, those that are then taking advantage of that data and using it as a basis to um, develop uh, new ideas, new ways of thinking, new ideas about solving the problems that we've identified, uh, new products and bringing new products to market. Um, and so that involves, um, again, the, the funders, the researchers, the manufacturers, um, the, the readers, you know, those that are um, more in the policy space to make sure that we have the right policy environment in order to uh, enable this to happen, and ultimately those that are delivering the goods, if you will, and actually uh, taking steps to address uh, disease, uh, burden of disease, and to reduce it. Um, so uh, the, the one thing that I, I'm not going to have time to talk about here today, but I think it's important, is um, to, um, you know, much the same as we uh, are really, really interested in having data to help describe what the, uh, the world is like in terms of uh, the burden of disease or lack of development or educational issues, and then what steps we need to take in order to reduce those burdens. The same thing arises in you know, the work that we do around publication and around access to data. And so in the case of access to data, you know, if we are driving for more open access to data, what are the barriers to being able to achieve that? And as I indicated, you know, we have made uh, some strides, at least with respect to work that we fund to reduce uh, those burdens, and we've identified um, burdens in six different areas. There's technical, motivational, economic, political, legal, and ethical barriers. And each one of those, you know, we can drill down into and expand upon. Um, but, you know, to suffice it to say that, you know, our experience has been that, you know, as we get um, uh, into those uh, barriers that we find, for the most part, that there are ways in the agreements that we strike that we can address them. Um, I think, and I'm looking forward actually to having a discussion here over the next couple of days, I think there are some areas that um, I think this group uh, perhaps is uniquely uh, suited to address around you know, some of the areas of, of um, uh, motivational or, or economic uh, in terms of you know, the, the motivation of those in the academic sector, uh, motivations around publishing, motivations around getting credit for the development and providing access to data and how those motivational factors can be improved in order to um, accelerate the movement of data from a more closed environment to a more open one. Um, so with that, I just wanted to emphasize again at the end, you know, that we are, you know, in, a, in an era certainly in the development of the Gates Foundation and I think more broadly uh, where uh, we are looking more towards developing the foundation to ensure we have open access to the data and information that arises from our funding. And I think this is going to lead to uh, an ability for not only you know, us as individuals or institutions to do our work, but collectively uh, to be able to work in a more uh, uh, collaborative, cooperative environment and to actually uh, unlock the potential of data and find the solutions that we're looking for to uh, the global problems that confront us all. So with that, I thank you very much. Sure. So we have a few minutes for questions. You might want to come to the mic because I think that might help for. We are recording, so it would be helpful to identify yourself as well. Uh, Simon Saki, Columbia University. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, are you supporting or plan to support other models, business models that are not APC charges? And the second one is what if a researcher wishes to publish in a journal that is practically compliant with your policy but it's not included in Kronos? Right. So, um, you know, with the. Um, I, I, I'll take both of those uh, in, 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 uh, in order. Uh, you know, we, um, you know, our, our objective is to see to it that the policy as laid out is, is fully complied with. I mean, and recognize that there are a number of different ways in which it can be done. I mean, one example that I gave was, um, you know, the specific license that we require, CC BY. 
Um, but there are other ways that what we're looking to achieve uh, can be accomplished. It doesn't necessarily have to be that license. You know, that would be the easiest one to be able to do it. So we do have you know, some flexibility when it comes to implementation. Go ahead. I was actually thinking. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thinking about, like, uh, for example, journals like PeerJ that have a different kinds of business model than article pro processing charges. Yeah, so, um, you know, right now, let me put it this way, right now, um, you know, we're not uh, driving to achieve that. You know, we're not driving to say what we want to do is to, at some point um, in the future, whether it's near or far, um, you know, to see to it that all of our articles are published, you know, only in journals that do not require an APC charge. Um, you know, for those that do, like I've indicated, we'll, we'll pay those charges. And, you know, we are, as I said, you know, we are gathering data now as to how much we're actually paying. And at some point, um, and I don't know when that's going to be, but it's certainly going to be after the end of this year when the policy is fully implemented, we will be looking at the level of those charges and, and what they actually reflect. You know, what is the value behind the APC charge? And, and then, you know, start getting into some of the more fundamentals around the APC charge and what it means, and, you know, including you know, the, the idea that you're suggesting. But we're not now, just to be clear, we're not now you know, saying that's what we're, we're aiming to accomplish. Um, and then, I'm sorry, could you remind me of the second one? I should take a note, but I... Sure. Uh, what if a journal is practically fully compliant right. with your policy, but it's not included in Kronos? Yeah, so um, uh, if it's practically fully compliant, um, we, uh, right, right now, we, uh, the, the, the strong desire is for people to, to go through Kronos for a couple of reasons. You know, one is um, it enables us to, um, you know, be able to develop a more uh, coherent and collected set of data about, you know, where articles are being published that arise from our funding and what we're paying in terms of fees and so forth. Um, um, but whether we would allow for articles that are otherwise compliant, you know, with it, but not to go through Kronos, um, that's something that, uh, to be perfectly honest, since I'm not on the implementation side of this, I mean, I'll get information about that and I can report back a little bit later. But I'm not sure, you know, where we are on that particular issue. But let me let me do that, because rather than, you know, say something that may, you know, be uh, inaccurate or incomplete, let me get that information. And I'll get back to this group before the uh, the session closes. Um, so one here, and one then here. over here. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, so I have two questions too. Seems to be the two question day. David Carlson from Texas A&M. First of all, I wonder if you could, um, I've found in my conversations with faculty that they're remarkably divergent in their views about sharing data. Some of them think it's a horrible end of the world scenario and um, don't want to do it. Right. And others of them think that it's um, the start of advanced civilization. <laughs> right. um, so I'm just wondering what your reactions have been in, to that from faculty. And then secondly, I'm just wondering if and you all may not care about this so much, but I know we in libraries sort of give it some thought. I wondered if there was any organizational angst involved in the scenario of double dipping, what we call double yeah. dipping by publishers, and whether or not you cared about it. That is, uh, article processing charges to subscription-based journals who are now essentially um, having their cake and eating it too. Right. <clears throat> Sorry, let me just take that second one first and I'll go back to the data sharing one. The answer is yes. <clears throat> you know, we have had at the, the foundation organizational angst about double dipping. Um, you know, where you have, if briefly, it would be a, a journal that charges an APC charge, but then in addition, you know, charges subscription fees for access to the journal as a whole. And so, you know, we've recognized that as being an issue, and much like, you know, the answer I gave earlier around um, the APC charges. Uh, and as I said during my presentation, it's something that we're thinking about. And we're thinking about it in the context of what is a reasonable APC charge? What does that charge reflect? Um, we're also thinking about the relationship between that charge and subscription charges. You know, so everything's on the table. Um, we just, quite frankly, didn't have, you know, the time to do a good enough job to think about, you know, that issue comprehensively. And also, uh, we didn't have the data that we, we wanted to have, which is, what we're going to be having uh, coming this year. Um, and so, 
we'll, we'll definitely be looking at that. You know, that's definitely on the table. Um, <clears throat> data sharing, bad or good? I think that, um, yeah, there was interesting, there was a New England, uh, there was an article by the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine that characterized reusers of data as data parasites, um, <clears throat> which got a lot of airplay and ultimately was um, not retracted, but there was a correction issued. Um, <laughs> they really mean parasites. <laughs> um, I was misquoted. Um, so th that is, th there are those uh, divergent uh, views. And this is one of the things that, you know, I think this group is uniquely capable of delving more deeply into. And, and not just to, you know, in, in your institutions to identify those that, you know, think that data sharing is evil and those that think it's, you know, the beginning of, of uh, greatness <coughs> for our civilization. Um, <clears throat> but rather understanding um, both what the concerns are as well as you know what the potential benefits are that are being identified for broader data sharing. Um, the on the, the the constraint side, I mean this this New England Journal of Medicine article I think made a good fundamental point. I think that you know it went too far in terms of characterizing those that want to make use or reuse of data as being um, parasites. You know I think. To a large extent, we're all on the shoulders of giants, learning from what other people did before, and then trying to move the ball forward a little bit. Um, and so, you know, that's not really a fair way to characterize it. But I do think that there is something more that needs to be done about um, researchers that are, um, you know, spending a large chunk of their professional lives, and you know, through that work, they are generating, you know, really. Uh, interesting data, interesting insights, and as they make that data more broadly available, others then will be learning from it and making insights and maybe writing articles or using that data. So the question is, you know, where is the, the equity? Where does the, the line of equity lie between, you know, wanting to ensure that all of the data that arises is broadly accessible, while at the same time, you know, giving due recognition for those that have generated those, those data sets, and that in itself has has value, um, and so again, that's you know something that we're at the foundation looking at, but it's not something that you know we alone have uh, either or can have a solution to, and arguably maybe not have like a, a sole voice on that issue that we can offer up. I think it's something we're going to have to do, you know, jointly with those in the academic sector that are are looking at ways to give uh, appropriate you know. Um, recognition, credit, and so forth to those that are generating the data that then is going to be you know, made broadly accessible. Yeah. Yes, Hi, uh, my name is Susan Riley, and I'm uh, the director of the Association of European Research Library of Libre. And we have, uh, we're running a pilot uh, as part of Open Air in Europe to fund uh, APCs for articles arising from European Commission funded projects. So I was very interested to hear about Kronos. Um, so my question, a self-interested one, is will you be sharing the data that you collect regarding um, the cost of APCs? Absolutely, yeah. It would be foolish for me to say otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that softball question <laughs> to end the day. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.